said, welcome back. Great to see you. Thanks, Carl. Um, Thanks for having me. I, I was thinking it's, it's kind of easy to convince yourself that nothing's happening because <laughs> right. uh, the headlines make you feel that way. Right. But you argue that the data doesn't back it up. No, we're certainly down from last year off by about a third from where we were in 2021. But it's still been a very busy environment out there. Uh, very active across private equity who, who continue to do a lot of deals because things are a little cheaper now. Uh, and large corporate buyers are still very active as well. So we saw August be twice as busy in terms of deal volume as we saw in July. So we, we think the rest of this year actually could continue to be pretty busy. So stair step into Q4 and then, right. and then early 23? Is that rollover? It, it should, right? One of the things that happens in an environment like this is that it takes a while for deals to get done. It takes a little longer. So yes, things that get started now clearly are going to be Q1 deals unless they really run fast. So we think at least into Q1 we'll see that busyness, and then you know we'll hope for the best in the back half of 2020. We mentioned SaaS and, and and healthcare. What's special about those two verticals right now? Well, I think on the SaaS side in general, what we've seen through the pandemic is just how resilient SaaS software providers are with their subscription models. Um, if you're an enterprise company that's betting how you run your business on a piece of software. You're not going to unplug that until the very last. You'll pay for your utilities, your rent, your people, and then what you pay to run your business on. That is going to continue. It's going to be very hard to disconnect from those SaaS companies. On the healthcare side, obviously, we've got a lot of work to do in this country with our healthcare system. And as technology and artificial intelligence helps us be better at that, you're going to see ongoing investments in that sector. Ted, are we going to see more, uh, I guess, arranged marriages uh, in M&A? And by that, I mean, this week, we had the announcement of Misfits Market acquiring Imperfect Foods. Not traditional tech, but it's certainly uh, tech driving a change in the, the food and grocery ecosystem. And yeah, Imperfect Foods had been around for longer than Misfit, but Misfits was arguably better operationally, which led for it to be the acquirer. So do you expect to see more deals like that where perhaps a company can't get more funding to compete but gets told, hey, you, you really need to pair up? We do see that, John. I think it's a great question. We see a lot of non-tech or non-traditional buyers eyeing the tech sector. Again, things are a little cheaper now than they were six to 12 months ago. So opportunities to focus on um, improving those operational side of the business for tech businesses that may have not grown into their full scale yet and to really augment what the, uh, what, the enter what the buyer is able to do through having an increased exposure to tech. So yes, we think we'll see more of that. One thing that still gets a lot of commentary is cross-border, just because of right. geopol obvious geopolitical tensions. Is right. that a real headwind? I think it is in, in the sense that I think it's still difficult to do deals with certain parts of the world, China in particular, Russia these days, obviously. Um, but I also think that with the strength of the dollar, which we've seen and you've talked about a lot on these shows, um, we, if you have a dollar-denominated fund, you know, the world's your oyster right now, right? Things are cheaper, so you'll probably go on a little bit of a shopping spree. Right. Um, the other thing, you mentioned healthcare. The Journal's got a piece out. I think the headline reads something like, Dr. Amazon will see you now. And Andy Jassy talked a lot about the potential for it to be uh, another huge pillar in the company's overall strategy. We obviously know about uh, One Medical. Um, his argument is that the, the customer experience, which sort of drives a lot of Amazon's thinking, needs to be reinvented in healthcare, and you just sort of alluded to it just now. I think that's right, and look, never bet against Amazon in terms of reinventing that customer experience. They've been so good at it for so long. It is one of the rare areas where they have stubbed their toe a little bit in some of their prior ventures, so the fact that they're coming back with one medical, not unlike Whole Foods, and saying, let's come at this from a different angle uh, and really try to do this a little bit differently than the first couple of times around, shows that they're very focused on just how big that market is and the opportunity for, that they have.